Welcome back to California Geology. Today we are talking about building California, specifically the Basin and Range Province. Okay, so in the last, the latest Precambrian, we saw a rifting event. So this is the tectonic evolution of California. We see two orogenies. We see the Antler orogeny in the Devonian and the Sonoma orogeny in the Permian Triassic. Um, the collisions of offshore arcs within North America help to generate these orogenies. Remember, orogenies are mountain building events. So the initiation of the continental margin subduction with trench in today's western Sierra foothills. And then we have the interruption of subduction by late Jurassic Novodian, Nevadian, excuse me, or orogeny. Accretion of another island arc terrain, and then we have initiation of mature Andean trench gap arc system of Franciscan Great Valley Sequence Sierra location. So basically what we see here is subduction in the late Jurassic that creates this orogeny in Nevada, and then we also see the initiation of a trench um, arc system, which is known as the Frances Franciscan Great Valley uh, Sierra Location, um, which is a bunch of metamorphic rocks that were created from the material that was scraped during the subduction. And we have subdu Cenozoic subduction of the Pacific Farallon Ridge, leading to growing non-slab zone, Laribide orogeny in the Rocky Mountains, then initiation of basin range extension and a San Andreas transform. So the Pacific Farallon Ridge is what's really created the rifting in the basin and range, and we'll talk about that rifting throughout this PowerPoint. Um, and it also helped create the San Andreas Transform Plate Boundary because once the Farallon Plate had disappeared, the Pacific Plate was able to move um, north in relation to the North American Plate and create that strike slip fault. Okay, so here is... Um, kind of a look at this. When you combine strike slip motion with a component of extension or a component of compression um, from bending from the faults or motions oblique to the fault directions, you create a number of characteristic topographic features. So here we have this pull apart basin because we see a strike slip fault pulling apart, but there's also extension happening in between. So when we see that we call this transtensional pull apart basins. Okay, so here's another formation of a transtensional pull apart basin. Um, here we see an area of tension or pulling apart, and then we have the Death Valley Furnace Creek fault zones, and then the other side of the Death Valley fault zone, and because these are strike slip on either side of this area of tension, it's creating this pull apart basin that is formed from the interaction between the Death Valley Fault System and the Furnace Creek Fault Zone. So this is what Death Valley looks like today. So this is essentially um, the pull apart basin in here, and then we have faults on either sides at the base of these mountain ranges that is pulling basically this tension zone apart. Okay, so the transverse ranges, like the San Gabriel Mountains, are formed by compression due to a big bend in the San Andreas Fault. So in the San Andreas Fault, we have this big bend, and that, as it's being pulled apart, as you see here, would be extended. Um, this would be a restraining bend, which would be a pushing. So the strike slip fault is moving towards that area. And then a releasing bend would be if it's pulling apart or the strike slip fault is facing the opposite direction. So we would either see a pull apart basin or a push up range, which would be fairly small. All right, so here is the big bend in the San Andreas Fault. Um, so if you didn't know, San Andreas Fault extends from Northern California all the way down to the Salton Sea. Um, and it bends right at the San Gabriel Mountains, okay? And then we have the transverse ranges, which uh, transverse across California. Um, and the big bend of the San Andreas Fault causes compression that pushes um, the transverse ranges up. 
here's a perspective of the Big Bang, or Big Bend, excuse me, um, and right in here where the two plates are sliding past each other and creating this fault, you'll see um, a large area where we see the transverse ranges come up, and they are coming up due to this push-up range, this restraining bend, so this bend because the Pacific plate is moving north and the North American plate is moving south relatively, it pushes them up and together, creating the transverse ranges. All right, so we look at some continental margin settings. There are four recognized types of ocean continental margins. California has all four at various times in the past billion years. So not all at once, but at various times. Okay, so let's talk about um, some of these different margins. So right now we are experiencing the San Andreas Transform or the Californian margin is what we're calling it. Um, previously in the Cretaceous, Jurassic, and part of the Triassic, um, we experienced the Andean and the Japanese was before that. Um, and these are characteristic of the Franciscan subduction. So this was the Farallon plate subducting beneath North America. Um, the foothills subduction, so what created the foothills of the San Andreas Mountains. The Sonoma orogeny, um, perhaps a rifting event, and the antler orogeny. And then we have um, the Atlantic margin, which occurred between the Silurian, late Devonian, or sorry, early Devonian, um, to Precambrian time. So this is characterized by the Cordilleran myogeocline and the Windermere rift event. All right, so the Atlantic type looks something like this. Um, it's a passive margin and it's not necessarily a plate boundary. Um, so here we might see rifted continental margins, um, sediment prisms. Um, we have continental crust here. Um, here's the myogeocline. Um, we might have a craton over here, continental slope and rise. We have oceanic crust and trans uh, transitional crust, excuse me. Um, so this is the interaction between some continental crust and oceanic crust, and we have a continental slope and rise created. And an Andean type is when we have a subduction close to shore, arc volcanoes built on continental basement. So we see subduction of the oceanic plate beneath the continental plate, and we see accretion along their interaction here, which is forming the subduction complex um, and some metamorphic rocks here in this in this um, trench, excuse me. And then there's the four arc basin, which will generally be sediments being collected between this um, trench accretion and the continental crust. Um, and then we will see the formation of batholiths from magma upwelling through the continental crust from the ocean water that has been added to the mantle that has lowered the mantle melting temperature and allowed that material to flow upwards. Then we have the Japanese type, which is subduction offshore with a marginal sea between the arc and the mainland. Um, so generally what this creates is an island arc. So this would be like our traditional oceanic oceanic collision um, where we do still see a trench. We see, still see oceanic crust kind of subducting beneath um, thinner oceanic crust that transitions into continental crust here. Um, and then the continental crust, this would be part of the continental margin over here, and we would see an island arc form from a volcanic um, upwelling from the, ma from the mantle. And then the Californian type is a transformed fault. This is where we have no subduction and no spreading. We just see uh, two plates sliding past each other. So we'll see um, an oceanic crust, continental crust slide past each other, and in between you'll see transform fault strands. So these will create the strike slip faults like the San Andreas fault. So we've talked about this before, but here are the provinces again. So we have the Klamath Mountains, Modoc Plateau, the Cascade Range, Coast Ranges, Great Valley, Basin and Range, which is what we're going to focus on in this PowerPoint, the Sierra Nevada, Mojave Desert, Transverse Ranges, Peninsula Ranges, and the Colorado Desert. 
All right, so let's get into this extension range. Okay, so the basin range consists of the highest peaks to the lowest troughs in California. And that is from all of the extension that occurs below. It is bounded on the west by the eastern face of the Sierra Nevada, and it extends east through Nevada to Hurricane Cliffs and Wasatch Front in Utah. Okay, so here is the extension of the Basin Range. So the, we talk about the Basin Range being in California, but it extends further than that. Um, so keep that in mind when we're talking about it. A lot of the same um, features that I'll talk about of the Basin and Range are not only present in California, they're present, present in other states as well. All right, so here it, what, here's what it looks like in satellite. So you can kind of see what I'm talking about by this basin and range extension. You can kind of see if this was all kind of squished together, it would look like a bunch of mountains. But what happened was it pulled apart and because of the tension occurring here, it's creating these up and down motions. Um, so you'll see high peaks and then low valleys. And so it starts in eastern Sierra Nevada. So this is the Sierra Nevada mountain range. It is um, the first mountain range as we extend into the basin and range province. So eastern Sierra Nevada elevations, the highest and lowest points in the lower 48 states are just 85 miles apart, both in California. So this is Mount Whitney. The elevation of Mount Whitney is 14,505 feet. And then in Death Valley, we see Badwater Basin, which is negative 282 feet of elevation. So generally, elevation decreases east of the Sierra Nevada, and this is the tallest point in the lower 48 states. And it's in California. It's pretty cool. All right, so these are some peaks of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, Mount Whitney being the top. Um, and then a lot of these other peaks um, near it are also very, very high in elevation. Here's Badwater Basin. Um, this is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, and it is in Death Valley in California. So it's negative 282 feet. All right, so some key features in California in the Basin and Range. We've talked about Death Valley so far. Um, we have the Panama Range, Panama Valley, um, Saline Valley, Inyo Mountains, Owens Valley, Long Valley, Mono Lake, Mammoth Mountain, White Mountains, China Lake, um, Cyril's Lake, and Owens Lake. So this is Mono Lake. The elevation here is 6,700 feet. Owens Valley full floor is at 4,000 feet. It's a little bit higher, a little bit lower, excuse me. And this is the Sierra Nevada in the background here. Panama Valley floor is at 1,500 feet, so we're getting even lower. Saline Valley floor is 1,000 feet. The Death Valley floor is at sea level, other than when you're at Badwater Basin, which is when you are below sea level. All right, so let's talk about the geologic history. Some of the oldest rocks in California are exposed on the eastern face of Death Valley and they are one to 1 1.5 billion years old. So it's really old considering our Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Having rocks present on the surface that are 1.5 billion years old is pretty remarkable. Um, they match rocks found in the Grand Canyon's inner gorge, and they may have been part of an ancient super supercontinent, Rodinia, tectonic extension that began about 17 million years ago. Um, they have an average crustal thickness uh, or the average crustal thickness of the basin range, excuse me, is about 30 to 35 kilometers. So opinions range regarding the total extension of the area. However, the median estimate is about 100% total lateral extension, which is pretty much the most that you can have. Um, so total lateral displacement in the basin range varies from 60 to 300 kilometers, since the onset of the extension in the early Miocene, with the southern portion of the province representing a greater degree of displacement than the north. So we see much more extension in the southern portion than in the northern portion. Um, the evidence exists to suggest that extension initially began in the southern basin and range and then propagated north over time. 
So uh, we also have something called the Rio Grande Rift um, in New Mexico, and that's similar to what we see in um, the extension of the basin range. So here's Owens Valley. You can see it in satellites. Pretty um, crazy to see. And then this is the entire extent of the basin range here. So in modern California's extension, what's happening right now is um, we see a series of normal faults that are basically pulling mountain ranges apart. Um, and the way that that's happening is you have um, normal faults that either face each other or face away from each other. So in this instance, if they face away from each other, um, if we drew our little guy across the fault, um, the remember the hanging wall has to go up in a normal fault. So foot wall up is normal. So if we put him in here, his foot, this would be the foot wall for this fault, and this would be the hanging wall. And then if we drew him over here, the foot wall would be this block. So these two blocks go up while the head walls go down. And so that creates a down drop basin or a graben. And then on either side, excuse me, we call those horsts. So we have a horse and a graben. So basically the basin range extension is just a series of a bunch of horse and grabins created from these faults, these normal faults. <clears throat> so in strike slip tectonics, it's a little bit different, right? We have sliding past each other. So this is a little bit of a review, um, knowing that we have the Pacific plate and the North American plate interacting along the coastline and creating that San Andreas fault. And um, this one happens to be a left lateral strike slip fault, but the San Andreas fault is a right lateral. So if we're standing along this stream here, looking across the faults, the rest of the stream is to the right. Same thing if we're standing along this stream here, looking across the fault, the rest of the stream is to the right. And so that's a right lateral strike slip fault. All right, let's talk about Rodinia a little bit. So here is kind of a look at what about 700 million years ago we think Rodinia looked like, which was one of the supercontinents similar to Pangaea. Um, and here we have some mountain belts and then existing mountain belts um, being created along these interaction of the continents that are coming together and falling apart. East of the Sierra Nevada, most of the ranges are consisting of sedimentary rocks that are 300 to 700 million years old, which is pretty old for sedimentary rocks because technically as soon as things start getting weathered and eroded, it's no longer a sedimentary rock, it's being formed into a new sedimentary rock. Or if these rocks get buried deep enough, they end up transforming into metamorphic rocks or melting and becoming igneous again. So rifting splits ancient supercontinent North America and it moves eastward. Eastern California was a continental shelf off the coast of the continent for a long period of time. Then we have a passive continental margin um, comparable to present day Gulf Coast and Florida. And thick layers of carbonate rocks deposited. So they are derived from corals and other marine organisms. So we see something called dolomite in the White Mountains that's very light colored. And so these came from that passive continental margin that created these carbonate rocks during the formation of the basin range. So here's a look at the White Mountains. And this is Papoose Flat in the White Mountains. Here's some light colored granite you might see in the White Mountains. So because we are very close to the Sierra Nevada Papalith, um, there will still be quite a few um, granitic rocks in the area. Here's some layered sedimentary rocks. You can see pretty clearly in this all of the different layers of the sediments. Okay, and then expansion and thinning of the crest. So um, in the last 25 to 30 million years, um, the northern or the North American plate has been dominated by extent expansion and thinning of the crust. Okay, so the North American plate comes in contact with 
northwestward moving Pacific plate after the disappearance of the Farallon plate, and the relative motion becomes tangential, stretching the southwestern North American plate. So we see large scale block faulting that's ex associated with expansion, and this produces those high relief parallel mountain valley sequences. And so again, we see this from Sierra Nevada east to North, uh, Nevada border. Um, we see this in map and cross section, and the faulting and erosion exposes billions of years old rocks in mountains several million years old. So here's kind of a before and after of um, extension. So we have uh, the lower plate and the upper plate here, and all of these are nor a series of normal faults. Um, and as they start moving, and you see this brittle ductile transition zone and all of these brittle movements, so basically rock breaking, um, you see this up and down pattern start to be created as all of those faults start actually shifting. So we see all of these different normal faults and as they move, they create these down drop blocks and as extension and tensional stresses is applied, this just gets more and more exaggerated as time goes on. Okay, so here's a general map of the area. We've looked at maps of the basin range for a while. Um, this shows the outline of Death Valley National Park and some of the other key features we've talked about, Owens Lake, Mono Lake, Little Lake, so here's a cross section of the Great Basin. So here is the Sierra Nevada, and then it dips down into Owens Valley. Then we go back up to the Inyo Mountains, and then it dips down into Panama Valley. Then we go back up to Panama Range, dips down into Death Valley. Then we go back up slightly to Funeral Mountains, and then we go down to Ar Argamosa Valley. And then we go back up to Napoa range. So there's a lot of up and down, the Sierra Nevada being the tallest range of the Great Basin. So as I've said before, faulting exposes these billion year old rocks. Um, so as the basin is dropped down, more rocks are exposed at the surface. And some of these happen to be billions of years old. So we see stretching and thinning of the crust. So the, as we've learned, the more we pull apart, the thinner the crust will become. Um, and that also can create some volcanic activity because the thinner the crust is, the easier it is for mantle material to kind of peek through and find cracks in the crust and then erupt on the surface. So Long Valley is actually in the area where um, it's in Owens Valley where the first extension occurs after the Sierra Nevada. Um, so it has produced massive eruptions um, about 700,000 years ago, and we see a lot of volcanic activity throughout Owens Valley. So if we take a look at some of the different volcanoes that we see in the basin and range, um, you'll see that there's an entire system of Inyo craters and Mono craters. Um, beginning at Mono Lake to the north, and it extends down to Mammoth. Um, most notably, I think, is Mammoth Mountain, which is on the boundary of the Long Valley Caldera. Um, and the last big scare for Mammoth Mountain's eruption, I think, was in 1980. Um, it didn't actually erupt, but um, there has been some scares on the mountain before. Um, and there is a lot of activity occurring in Long Valley, we have this resurgent dome in the center that indicates a lot of volcanic activity where we see hot springs and some geothermal vents um, that tell us that it is currently active. And this is from the crust being so thin there and mantle material actually making its way upwards. All right, so here's another look at the Long Valley caldera. So this is the extent of the caldera here. This is cross section, so cutting it in half essentially. Here we see the resurgent dome. We have some CO2 being released along Mammoth Mountain. 
And below, this is kind of what we surmise is occurring. A lot of it is basaltic. And then we do have some congealed magma here, um, which if uh, Long Valley uh, drops down any um, bit from pressure, we might see actually the escape of the magma uh, material, which has previously happened and created this Bishop Tuff. Um, and then we do have some post caldera lavas and fill from Mammoth Mountain. So here is the volcanic tableland. So all of this is volcanic deposits. Here is the Bishop Tuff. So in one of my videos um, that I sent you guys, I think last week or the week before, um, I talked about the Bishop Tuff a little bit and how there is some present in Fresno, actually. Um, if you go north on Willow Avenue and, and you're almost to the intersection of Willow and Friant Road, um, there is a little road cut that you can look at and there is some Bishop Tuff there. Um, and most of it is all ash. So this has some particles of other rock in it when you're in Owens Valley. Um, and there's massive deposits like this of the ash from the Long Valley caldera eruption. Um, but in Fresno, there is just a, a little bit. Um, but it's still pretty cool that it made it all the way over those really large mountain range, the Sierra Nevada. So the thinning of the crust is producing this volcanic activity. We've talked about a massive eruption um, that happened in 700,000 years ago and created that tableland north of Bishop. Um, we also see the Owens River, River Gorge that cuts through this soft volcanic rock um, and the Chidago Canyon. So here is Owens River, River Gorge. Um, you can walk up it and visit it. And it's really interesting because this is all basaltic material that is cutting through this lighter ash that came from um, the volcanic eruption of Long Valley. So this created all of this ash, and then this is a more basaltic material that actually Owens River has kind of cut through. So we have some radial joints um, and columnar joints, which columnar basalt is basically when the horizontal lava is cool and then weak planes are developed by radial contraction which causes these joints um, and this will cause a lot of toppling so if any of these rocks kind of come loose um, they will topple over instead of a traditional rock fall or landslide that you're used to they just kind of topple um, and these are really only present in basaltic material but we see this a lot. Um, a very good example is Devil's Post Pile, which is in uh, Mammoth. Um, here's Chidago Canyon. It shows you some of the transition um, between the basaltic material and the ash. Um, so this has been oxidized quite a bit. So continuing with our stretching and thinning of the crust, let's talk about Mammoth Mountain a little bit. Um, not only does it produce that volcanic activity, but it has produced this Mammoth Mountain, which is a large volcano on the rim of a caldera, um, which is interesting to see because usually calderas are standalone, um, and then they might have some subsequent activity here and there, but to have an entire separate um, volcanic system being fed on the rim of a caldera is really interesting to see. So here is Mammoth Mountain. Um, it produces mostly basaltic material. So Mammoth, Air, Mammoth Mountain area shows evidence of ongoing volcanic activity. Like I said, there's been several scares in the last 30, 40 years um, of the mountain actually erupting. Uh, we do see a lot of carbon dioxide that is killing trees and creating breathing hazards in the area. Here is Inyo Crater. So this is one of the craters in the area that has erupted previously and all of the material was evacuated from the area so it created a crater and which subsequently filled in with water because it's a low point. So the Mono Basin also has active um, volcan volcanoes and creates a lot of craters in the area because a lot of these are short-lived and evacuate all of the material and as soon as all of the material is evacuated 
it leaves those big holes in the ground, which we call craters. So here are the Mono craters. It's kind of a series of different uh, volcanoes in the area. Um, and some have actually completely collapsed and evacuated the material. Some have only evacuated par parts of the material. Okay, and then we have Crater Mountain and Lava Flows in Owens Valley. So here's another look at that. So we see um, Crater Mountain Lava Flows in Owens Valley. So this is mostly all low points. And then you have the one uh, Crater Mountain here. Then we have Rainbow Canyon, which has cut into volcanic deposits on the edge of the Darwin Plateau. So here is Rainbow Canyon. You can kind of see the layers of volcanic deposits here. Um, and they are also, because it's a canyon, we are losing material from the sides from rock falls and rock avalanches. Here's another look at Rainbow Canyon. You can kind of see why they call it Rainbow Canyon. All of the different colors. Okay, so looking at what we are talking about. So we are here in Fresno. This is the Sierra Nevada. Long Valley Caldera is up here. Owens Valley is down here. And then the Mojave Desert is down here. Okay, so let's look at some of the geology. Um, we've already been pretty familiar with talking about different um, volcanic rocks um, and then we know that most of the Sierra Nevada is full of this granitic rock that is mostly Mesozoic in age. Um, Owens Valley has a mixture of some marine sediments because they are a valley where material will fluff off the mountain ranges and settle in the valley so you're going to see some uh, sedimentary deposits and then there is still Cenozoic volcanic rocks so that's what all these pinks are. So all the different pinks are your volcanic rocks. And then we do see some kind of intermixed sedimentary and volcanic rocks in these blue areas. And remember the red is still all granite. Okay, so hopefully you learned a little bit about the basin and range today. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!